it's not about the adversity or challenge. It's how you respond to that. And it's what is, again, your mindset and how do you, you know, persevere when others can't or won't. That's really what separates a lot of folks from others. Welcome back to the Canadian Dream Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about fitness, health, and business with Chris Smith, the CEO and president of Fitness World Canada. Welcome, Chris. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. I would love to know uh, a little bit about your journey growing up in the States, correct? Yeah. Before we talk about what you do currently in Canada and how business is going, how you see the opportunities for the future, et cetera. Sure. Cool. How long have you been in Vancouver or, or Canada for? Mm -hmm. Just almost 14 years now. And you're currently the CEO and president of Fitness World Canada. That's correct. Yeah. How many locations do you guys have? 17 currently. In? All in the lower mainland, all here in BC. All in BC. Yeah. And uh, well, later we can talk more about that and if you plan to expand, et cetera. Sure. Are you also involved in other businesses? Yeah, I got a few other things that we're involved in as part of, you know, Fitness World, Fitness World Canada. So we operate uh, British Columbia Personal Training Institute. So that's a personal training school that we do. Um, involved with ATFW, which is all things fitness and wellness, which is kind of a podcast media company, if you will, that's designed to really promote and protect the industry as a whole. And, uh, you know, partnered there with Chrissy Band. So doing a great job there in terms of, you know, what we've got going. And then a couple other little side projects, but they're not... Uh, what I would call as, as meaningful or, or substantial at this stage. And your life is half here and half in the States. Well, it's mostly all here. So I, I have a house that's just across the border. Uh, I go home on most nights. It takes me 35, 40 minutes to get from my house, from my door, all the way to the door of my office in Richmond, uh, BC is where our offices are at. So a lot of people have worse commutes than 35 to 40 minutes. So I spend most of my days there, but I also have, do have an apartment in Vancouver that I, I stay at from time to time. And do you see any difference between Canada and the States as soon as you cross the border, or is it a little bit more subtle than that? Yeah, everything's subtle. That's how I try to explain it to most people. Usually it's more Americans that are interested in understanding the subtle differences in terms of Canada or Canadians mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. I mean, Canadians are known for their politeness, which is very true, uh, generally speaking, even the way in which I think people drive in Canada, a lot more respectful and understanding that, hey, we're all in this together uh, when you're in bad traffic, as an example, versus the U.S. It's, you know, for some reason, there's 3% of the people out there that they're, they're, they're more important uh, and they're in a bigger hurry than the rest and they drive that way and it kind of can create frustration for everyone, right? That sort of thing. So everything's just a little bit different, right? Whether it's the music, the cars, the TV shows, but when you add it all up, it is, you know, substantially, it is a different country as it should be, right? I mean, respectfully, yeah. I mean, they're very, they're very different places. And where were you born? Uh, I was born in Southern California. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your childhood. How was it for you growing up in California? I was a big kid. I was born 10 pounds, 13 ounces. So I was a big boy from the start, uh, coming out and uh, into this world here. But uh, yeah, so I just kind of, you know, was fortunate to, you know, that, that in some ways was a gift, right? Just the genetics that I was born with, if you will, in terms of how that set me up later in life from an athletic perspective and the ability to be successful in sport and those sorts of things. Were you a bully as a child? No, I wasn't the bully. I was the protector. So if you got bullied, you'd come to me and say, hey, Chris, so-and-so is bullying me. And I'd go over and say, hey, you need to apologize or fix this. And they'd be like, what if I don't? I'm like, you know what's going to happen if you don't. So I would say I was the guy that bullied the bullies, right? And, so and I, I did was, you get in trouble at school? Well, fortunately, I was in this still at school and I went through school where, you know, if you got in a fight, you weren't suspended the rest of your life. So certain things could be remedied uh, through those types of altercations. So it's safe to say that I grew up in, I grew up in rural Northern California and uh, Auburn, Grass Valley area. So people are like, well, what does that mean when you say rural? I'm like, there was no stoplights. So where I grew up, there's a couple stop signs mm -hmm. and that's it. So yeah, things were settled in different ways and arguments were figured out, if you will, but Certainly gotten my my fair share of uh, scraps uh, growing up in that in that environment. And how was your relationship with your parents? I had a great relationship with my parents, uh, both of them, both my mother and my father. You know, my dad was a hardworking kind of construction worker. My mom uh, worked kind of as an administrator, then eventually kind of in real estate. So they both worked really hard to provide. Um, neither of them had ever graduated from college. Um, so that was kind of always in the back of my mind as a focus and a goal. I kind of set myself apart. They divorced when I was 12. 
And how was that for you? Um, I mean, it was always a challenge, right? I mean, that's a, that's a hard for like a lot of kids, right? It can be a defining moment uh, in a lot of ways. And for me, it didn't necessarily define, I think, my life, but I certainly put me on a bit of a different trajectory. And, you know, I uh, spent a lot of time helping with my siblings as I was growing up there, as my mom was, I think, going through her own process of finding herself after that divorce and whatnot. Uh, so I just helped my siblings homework, you know, school. So I learned a lot of responsibility at a pretty young age. So did you have to raise your siblings, basically? Yeah, I mean, raised might be a little too far in the sense of, you know, my mom and my dad were obviously still around, but I would say I was heavily involved in terms of, you know, supporting them and being there for them and, and doing what needed to be done. How many siblings did you have and uh, what's the age gap between you and the youngest? Uh, well, I have an older brother, uh, Shane. He's out on the East Coast. I have a little brother, Dustin, a little, little sister, Janelle, and another little sister, Laura Bell. So three below and one above. Looking back now, do you think that your your personal skills now managing so many people you have what 700 people working yeah. for you now yeah about 700 about 700 yeah so did you do you think that the, that skill to manage people started helping raise your siblings yeah it probably started there i think it probably could have been the first domino for sure in terms of just learning how to deal with difficult situations communicating you know working through adversity and challenges and all the things that you deal with as you know in business uh, and in life, really, right? So that was probably the, a start of it. I do think that my sports life and the coaches and the teams that I was on as a as a young man certainly shaped me, you know, oh, I, quite a bit. That's what I really wanted to talk about. So your sports career, it, it started at an early age. How old were you when you really started taking basketball seriously was it basketball the first thing um well i played a lot of sports i was like doing you know your basic stuff that a lot of kids do your recreational soccer or your recreational i was on a baseball team but i was such a big kid right but my parents again i grew up fairly poor we didn't have a lot of money uh one of the coaches really wanted me actually on a basketball team and so he asked my parents if i could be on the team and they said they couldn't afford for me to play and they didn't have the time to drive me to practice because of their work schedules he said that's fine i'll pick them up and drop them off that's how bad he wanted me on the team. So that kind of, you know, that started at an early age for me in terms of, you know, again, just some physical gifts or physical differences that, you know, kind of set me apart. And I was, you know, blessed, you know, in the, in that sense to just have some different kind of physical abilities than, than others. And some of that, that you can't teach, AKA size, right? You can't teach size you either have it or you don't. Right. And I was always a big, strong, fast kid as well. Right. So it was more than just being big, but yeah, so I started playing basketball in fifth grade, and then I started playing football shortly thereafter. And football is what I ultimately played college, and then a little bit of arena football with. So football, not soccer, American football. American football. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. And eventually you got a scholarship, is that correct? Yeah, I got a scholarship uh, to play football. I mean, I was, you know, a, a, an all-state athlete in three different sports in high school in California, in both, you know, track and field, basketball, and then football. Football was the sport I was built to play in college. I tell people my love was basketball, but I wasn't built for that. Well, I always thought you were playing basketball. No, no. I mean, I played basketball all the way through high school, and but I didn't play in college and beyond. And what did you go to college for? In what position was I playing? No, no, no. What were you studying? <laughs> uh, well, my original study was to be a history teacher because I want to be a history teacher and a football coach because the people that had mentored me and shaped me to that point, I admired them in such a way where I wanted to kind of follow them and their path and their lifestyles and whatnot. They were I, also history teachers? Well, they were just teachers, right? Okay. History was a subject I was really interested. After one semester of college, I changed my major. I was like, I'm done with history. So what did it change it to? Uh, exercise physiology. Okay. Because I started getting enamored with the human body and movement, um, how, you know, exercise was changing my life and having an impact on me. So, you know, my, my career in the fitness industry isn't by accident. Like, it's been a passion for me my whole life. So I always tell people, you know, chase your passion, not your pension. Right. And so people want to chase money and dollars and where can I make a quick buck and this and that. And for me, it was always, you know, I learned from somebody a long time ago, just chase your passion. And if you do that, and if you're genuinely passionate about it, then the money will follow you. Right. Money okay. follows you instead of you chasing it. How long were an athlete for and what made you decide to quit? Yeah. I mean, I was an athlete up until I was 25 years old and I can't remember when I wasn't playing some type of sports growing up as a kid. Right. I mean, I grew up without you know, cell phones and iPads and computers in house. So, I mean, all we did was play and play outside. I mean, I used to go running 
for, you know, I'd go running with two basketballs, dribbling basketballs around my neighborhood for like a mile, you know, I'd go run and dribble and practice like nonstop. I mean, I was very, very, you know, driven to try to be successful. And where I grew up again, not very many kids, um, you know, made it out of there in the sense of getting scholarships, right. A athletically. Cause again, it was pretty rural, small area. So I was determined to kind of break the mold and be one of those people that could get out with that type of an opportunity, which again, I was able to do. So when did you quit and why? Uh, I quit because, I mean, my, my contract in arena football, the team was going to move from Portland, Oregon to Oklahoma City. And at that point, I was, you know, married for several years with my wife. We had, a, you know, some young children. And so the idea of moving and moving and moving again just didn't appeal, right? And so moving to Oklahoma City, which at that time, I just didn't have a desire to do so. So just after arena football, and that's kind of what I would have needed to do, I'd had some NFL tryouts and some different things, and just none of it really panned out. And so... It was just but you were making money playing. Yeah, I was making money playing, but I mean, the goal was to get to the NFL, right? So when I knew that that dream was dying or dead, mm -hmm. right, then I just kind of made a business decision on, you know, my future. And, and, I, and I had started as a personal trainer and I was doing well. So I said, well, do I keep chasing football or do I go maybe into this as a career and, and kind of get started here? Why do you think, I know there's probably a bunch of factors, but what was the main factor why you think you could not make it to the NFL? Yeah, I mean, I've talked about this at different times, but I mean, I, I tell people my this in, in business. So people will say, this is kind of a long answer or long story, but people will say, can I be you or I want to be you someday? And I, I tell them, I'm like, you can't. And they're like, what do you mean you can't? I'm like, you won't make the sacrifices I made. You won't do the things that I did. I'm like, well, what do you mean? I said, for 20 years, I started at 5 a.m. and I ended at 11 p.m do that not not for a day not for a week not for two weeks not for two months not for two years but for two decades and people don't want to put in that kind of work ethic or, or that kind of sacrifice and so and that's in my professional like business career and so the reason that I really didn't make the NFL or some of those things I tell people is because I wasn't coachable and so you know I sat down across from NFL scouts as an all-american in college I was a 4.0 student I was the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference male student athlete of the year, right? So academically, you know, pretty intelligent guy, if you will. And then have scouts sit across from me and say, you're not going to get to the NFL because you're not coachable enough. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty rough, right? So there's a dream that you have and it's, and it, and it wasn't wrong. So I still had some issues around temper and mannerisms and how I professionally would handle myself, uh, in meeting rooms or on the field from time to time. And that shows up, right? It shows up on video coaches notice coaches talk to scouts. And so to hear that, so when I got in my business career, I said, I will never be the guy that's not coachable. I will, I will do whatever you ask me to do, provided you don't ask me to lie, cheat, or steal, right? An unlawful order, if you will. Other than that, whatever my boss has told me to do, never, I mean, I would question if I needed clarity to go execute what was being asked of me, but I would never challenge. I would never push back again because of how it inhibited my dream, right? Of, yeah. of being in the, you know, playing in the NFL someday. And so that was rough. So that was a hard lesson to learn, but one that was worth, obviously, you know, happened for a reason. And I've kind of lived my life that way. And I've tried to teach that lesson to as many people that I can uh, yeah. just, just be coachable. This bitter taste of failure is also crucial for anybody who is successful, mm. right? Do you see that way as well? Because you, you probably don't want to say it it was a failure because you achieved so much. No, I mean, I mean well, it was but a failure in the sense of I didn't get ultimately didn't, very important. to where I was trying to go, so I failed in that endeavor. I mean, my goal, I used to say, was to play professional football or get paid to play football. Yeah. I achieved that. Did I get paid by the NFL? Did I make it? No, I did not. So ultimately, I failed my ultimate goal in that way. So that was certainly, you know, shaping me then. But I do agree that, like, yeah, I think adversity and challenges and really, you know, it's not about the adversity or challenge. It's how you respond to that. And it's what is, again, your mindset and how do you, you know, persevere when others can't or won't. Yeah. Right. And I think that's really what separates a lot of folks from others. In my teens, I was a long distance runner and I ran until I was 18 and I did get a salary and I was training for the world championships cross country when I decided to quit. Because I wanted to travel with my older sister, backpack around the world for one year. And I was training 10 times a week. So I, I, I know what it takes to, to be at the top, let's say yeah. top 2%.
but I knew I would never get a medal in the world championships. Never, never. I wasn't ready to commit 100%. You have to be so obsessive to be in the top 1%. You have to be, let's say, 80% obsessive to be in the top 10%, but 100 to be the top one. Do you agree? I think that makes sense, yeah. I think that's a fair way to put it. And I wanted to to experience so much more in life, including I wanted to gain some weight and have and look better. I was so skinny being a long distance runner. I wanted to to have a one day off a week would be enough, you mm-hmm. know, for someone training 10 times a week. Yeah. But there were many other things that I wanted to do. And I also wanted to backpack and travel around the world. So I decided to do that. And I never regret it. But the lessons that I learned training at that level are, are transferable. And for me, the main one was um, planning and having discipline, knowing that if you have goals, there is always a process. You might not achieve your goal or you might end up changing your goals later on. Oh, I wanted to break this record. Oh, now I want to break that one. Oh, I wanted to compete. I don't know, it's 3,000 meters. Oh, now I want to run the 5,000 meters. But you know, okay, my goal is in three years, I want to do this. And now every single day matters, right? What was the main lesson that you took from all those, say, 20 years as an athlete? Um, I, I just think it's the, it is the kind of the daily discipline, right? It's like the, the daily discipline that, you know, you learn over time. So I think I was a freshman in high school. So 14 years old when I learned, you know, your attitude will determine your altitude. And it became something that I believed. And again, I was part of a school that frankly at that time was a losing program. Like we weren't a great, I would call it football powerhouse program in the state of California. And I had some great coaches and, you know, a gentleman named Ron Short, um, the head coach of that program. He was the one that coined that phrase, attitude, turn your altitude. Terry Logue, who's, you know, still a friend and a man that I admire in many, many ways, was, was the varsity, you know, coach. But, I mean, we, we, we won a state title, right, my junior year in high school. They won another state title uh, two years later. They won several more after that, and they're still well-known in the state um, as kind of a football, you know, school slash powerhouse um, in, in that sense. But... Yeah, and that was just around daily discipline, right? So you got to show up to practice. You got to be on time. You got to be in uniform in the sense of like have the right gear on, right? You got to show up and be prepared. Mm. Uh, and all, all the things that you can learn, I think sport is a great teacher of all things, regardless of whether it's, whether you're a runner, whether you're a football player there, whether you're playing, you know, European football, what I like to refer to as soccer, doesn't matter, right? All of those things are such great places to learn the lessons of, you know, really discipline. And then what is required to be successful? Because if you want to play at the highest levels or you want to be one of the best teams, right, um, then you have to do things differently and make sacrifices that others may not be willing to make. Mm -hmm. Are there any situations today in business where you go, oh, I, I know how to deal with that because I trained for this, say, in football or in basketball? Not really anymore. I mean, the, 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 the time gap between, you know, when I was still competing at a high level with, you know, versus what I've been doing professionally for the last 25 years, give or take. I mean, you know, a lot of time has passed and the generations have changed, right? So when we think about today's team member or indoor employee versus what it was, you know, then, and I, if anything, that might be it, right? So you say, okay, well, we're going to play this team versus that team. And it's like, well, you can't necessarily do the same game plan, even if you're running a race and it's like, well, there's different competitors from different schools. And this guy, if you, you know, let them run away from you, you'll never catch them versus this person. All you got to do is stay with them and then eventually they'll fade out. So you just got to kind of know who you're dealing with and and adjust your strategy a little bit um, as time goes on. But the fundamentals are kind of always the same. And what was the main mistake that you made in your sports career? Uh, Well, I think, again, I just, I wasn't coachable at times as I should have been. It's not to say I was always uncoachable, but there was just times where I would say my emotional maturity was not where it needed to be. I didn't handle situations appropriately as a good teammate um, or as a you know player for a particular coach or whatever it might have been. And so that's where I had to really grow, right? Were you a bit like that guy from the Bulls, Rodney? Rodney. Rodman? No. Uh, Rodman? No. <laughs> no, no. I, I wasn't dyeing my hair and, and out running around to Vegas and going crazy. I mean, he was he was out there doing some crazy stuff, but... 
No, I was more like in just temperamental and practice. And if things didn't go my way, I would, you know, visibly show frustration. I didn't have the just, you know, self-discipline at that stage of my life to just kind of emotional maturity to kind of process challenges and again, be more solutions oriented. Whereas now that's what it's more about. So now I try to tell people like when you're a CEO of a company, um, at, at least at a certain scale, it's not about, oh my, I, I hope I don't have any problems. Today. Every day you're going to have a giant problem every day, mm. every single day. So the thing is, well, what are you going to do with it? You, there's no panic anymore, right? It's like, what's the problem? this and that. And immediately I just snap into what's the solution. Okay. Let's get so-and-so on the phone. Let's get an email to these people. Let's figure this out. Has anyone reached out to so-and-so yet? Have we done that? And you just start going through the, the checklist, right? Um, to make sure that your solutions are resolution orientated and you're trying to get there as quickly as possible, at least, you know, in a, in a fair and equitable way. Right. Yeah. At least in my business. So I want to know um, more about the challenges you're facing now and your mindset now, what inspires you, what gets you out of bed now, what keeps you up at night. Uh, but let's fill this gap. What happened from the age of 25 to today? You had a family, you have uh, five kids, correct? Yep. So in, say, one minute, what happened until when you came to Canada or until you came and started working with Fitness World? Well, I mean, I start, I was a personal trainer when I became an independent trainer because at, you know, 26, I thought I knew everything. Shocker. That never happens today. Uh, then after about a year of that, I was actually bored, went to a company called 24 Fitness, had an incredible 10-year run with that company, rode that rocket ship, built some incredible relationships with people that I still call, you know, mentors to this day. Um, and, you know, Jim Rowley, Mark Mastroff, Derek Gallup, and a host of others, um, met, you know, met a lot of incredible people. And then that kind of teed me up for, as I exited that organization to kind of find my way up to this one, uh, as they obviously had some ownership and involvement at that time in what was, you know, the Steve Nash fitness clubs. And then as that business, uh, went through the challenges of the pandemic and was put into bankruptcy, I was fortunate to be in a position to acquire it, uh, with a new partner. And so we were able to, you know, accomplish that and bring it out of the bankruptcy and bring it out the other side. And just, you know, we've had a great run here the last few years and that's kind of the rocket ship, right? So that's, you know, I think in a minute or less, yeah. you know, covering that span, but lived in a lot of places, um, you know, around, you know, the continental U.S., um, mostly Western states. But yeah, I've overseen locations essentially all over North America at this stage of my career. So you've always worked in the fitness world. Yeah, my, well, they my company's fitness world, but I've always worked in the fitness space. I mean, nowadays I even refer to it as like the health and wellness space because I think fitness is yeah. expanded beyond the idea of what even the average person thinks of it as, right? It used to be people would show up at the, the gym with very much aesthetics in mind. And now, you know, you show up with, I'm just here for my mental health, yeah. which that's always been okay, but now it's talked about, right? Um, so, you know, yeah, my entire career has always been in the fitness space and the fitness kind of industry. How did you react and how did you process the absurdity that it, it was the idea that all over the world, people should not exercise during the pandemic? What they should do was staying at home instead of exercising. Well, I mean, I think again, back to some of the work that, you know, I like to do with, you know, FIC, Fitness Industry Canada, and that group that advocates on behalf of the industry here, um, URSA you know, who, which does a great job in the U S you know, led by the CEO, Liz Clark is that the government weren't responsive because frankly, the industry hadn't advocated enough prior. So they were a little asleep at the wheel. And so if you're looking for a seat at the table, then you got to do your homework and do your due diligence and be proactive. And unfortunately the industry as a whole didn't do enough of that. So our, our ministers in Canada, health ministers, as an example, I don't think had enough, uh, credible research available. And that's not even just because they're going to make informed decisions based on what they know. In the absence of information, they're going to try to make the best decision possible with the information they have available. The challenge the industry faces, there wasn't enough information available. Now, as information's continued to roll in, right? Because even shortly into the pandemic, it was the WHO that came out. So the number one thing you can do to prevent this is to exercise, you know, and do cardio three times a week. And so then that was the first, I think, kind of, oh, oh, aha moment for a lot of people. And shortly, kind of midstream during the pandemic, there was another, you know, big research studies coming out of the University of Pennsylvania, University of Oregon, that were, again, independent studies, independent from the industry, right? They weren't funded by someone in the industry, if yeah. you will. 
And so then as research continued to pour on, I think it was part of what even opened up and changed mindsets. But certainly, yeah, it was very frustrating to have, say, fitness facilities closed, but liquor stores open. Because again, I think most people can, from a logic perspective, connect the two to say, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And what was your plan when you decided to reopen Fitness World during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the definition is like, you know, when you, people hear about organized chaos, I mean, that's what's going on. So, you know, unfortunately I had the, 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 I had to fire 2000 people in seven days. Right. And then again, back to, I think mindset and people, and I've, I've commented about this before, but you know, I think it's worth sharing and it's probably the story of my book someday, which is again, back to like the mindset side of it. I mean, I was pretty low, right? This is me sitting in my office, throwing things, uh, crying, being upset, and, you know, it's pretty low. That's a pretty low spot for me, probably the lowest I've ever been professionally. And then there's really kind of, I think back to the mindset, I, I you know, that temper tantrum, that uh, fit of rage or whatever you want to call it as I sat in that building by myself on that day during the early, you know, early days of the pandemic, but the business has been bankrupted. I, I started reading some stuff and I made a decision that day that I was going to find a way to fix this. And when I said we fix this, I was going to try to reemploy as many of those people as possible. Because I just felt really strongly that if this was going to come out the other side in a positive way, that I had to play a vital role in that. I just thought that that was going to be important. And as it turned out, that was true. And so I kind of flipped out of this, you know, moment of low into just a moment of clarity and focus around what do I need to do? So the, you know, through that bankruptcy, I was only allowed to keep seven employees. I had seven people through that, that period of time, six, seven months, um, to kind of structure the company, do all that. Mm -hmm. We, we, we basically did... Wow. You know, we did 15 leases in 45 days. Anyone that's done a commercial lease understands that that is like near impossible to accomplish. But again, I had great brokers, great partners. The trustee did a great job. Everyone kind of played a role in terms of helping that come out the other side. And then, you know, opening clubs. I told the bank and I told everyone, I said, I'm going to open all these clubs in 30 days. The day we signed the deal, I signed the deal on like July 6th. They said, when are you going to open your first club? I said, the 15th. They said, you don't have any staff. How are you going to do that? I said, I'll personally open the club. I'll be there, which I was. And so myself, I was at one club. My vice president, Dylan Wade, was at the other club. So I opened our How and Davey. Another Dylan, not the Dylan I know. No, different Dylan. Okay. Dylan Wade is the vice president. Dylan Campanero, who you know, he's the general manager yeah. at uh, our Camby location. He's amazing, by the way. Can I, can I say hi to Dylan? Yeah. Dylan, you are awesome. <laughs> Campanero, Dylan Campanero. <laughs> he's a stud. But uh, yeah, so we just opened the clubs. And so that's, you know, also just always been part of my, I mean, I grew up in the clubs, right? Mm -hmm. I started there. I've never been afraid to do anything that's in the clubs. I'm still not afraid to do anything. If, if somebody needed a tour, I'm happy to do it. Somebody needed a personal training stand in, happy to do it. You need a group fitness class, I can do it. It depends <laughs> what format. If you want to do Zumba, it's going to be bad, right? I'm not a great dancer, but I can lead people and still figure out like how to deliver a great experience. Yeah. And so people can, you know, have fun and, and do what they want to do. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there was the behind the scenes to answer the question. It was just, it was organized chaos. But yeah, there was definitely like the plan. Like I built a pro forma. I had a business plan I'd shared with mm -hmm. like different institutional investors. I had a lot of people calling me trying to be my financial partners, if you will. And I just knew kind of where directionally I wanted to go. And I was able to, you know, get the right partner. And it's, it's been, a, been a fun ride. So what were the main points that you thought, okay, this is what is going to is going to help us become successful during these hard times. The government had announced that they were going to start to do some government support for different businesses, but we really had no idea still really how that was going to materialize for Fitness World at that stage. But we really kind of said, okay, look, if we're going to do this and buy this business and bring it out the other side, let's go ask all the Steve Nash members. Let's ask all the Steve Nash employees. Let's ask them what they didn't like and let's change it. Right. And then, so we looked at some industry trends. We went and talked to all these people. So when people say, well, did you guys just put like a new name on it and rebrand it? It's like, no, we, we completely changed the business. Like we changed the pricing structure. We changed, you know, the way that the clubs operate. We changed the look, the feel, the brand, uh, the, the, the equipment. We swapped out yeah. almost all the equipment and all the locations. Like completely changed the floor plan, the footprint to, to, you know, modify the member experience to what the consumer was asking us for. Mm -hmm. Right. So we made a ton of changes during that time. Uh, we offered as much goodwill as we could possible, which is, you know, back to strategic decisions. We honored all these memberships that, you know, like we didn't own them. We didn't get any money or revenue from these, 
but we honored a bunch of stuff from a Goodwill perspective because we said, if we take care of those people long-term from a brand reputation standpoint, that will be good for us. Um, and so, yeah, and, and turns out that, you know, that was a good decision. Yeah. We made so many decisions and we made so many decisions so fast from chaos. That's why I try to tell people like somehow we got most of them right. Mm -hmm. Cause the speed and the intensity at that time was incredible. Because on top of that, yes, you're dealing with governments telling you what you can and can't do. You're dealing with all sorts of, you know, member disruptions. And then you've got back to like, it's not really about political stance, just about the differences in humans, right? You got some members that are super thankful that they're six foot distance and everyone has to wear masks and all the rest. And there's other people that are throwing a fit over it, right? And they refuse to comply. But if they don't comply, if a health inspector shows up, they can shut you down. Yeah. Right. So you just got to deal with the human element, right? Which, you know. Yeah, that's a challenge, but at the same time, you know, it, it's worth going through. And you kept growing. So uh, right yeah. after the pandemic, how many people did you have when you open? When you had all the gyms open? Well, I mean, we've grown up into where we are now, which is you know just right around seven hundred. But I mean, yeah, I mean, we very first started, we opened two clubs that first thing. We opened a couple more like a few days later, and within th kind of thirty forty five days, they were all open. And then we had to close one, and then now we've opened you know, three others. So now we're at 17 total. And previously you worked a lot in the States. How, was there anything different here in Canada? Did you notice, or at least in British Columbia? I mean, there's definitely differences, behavioral or depends how you describe it. I mean, I, in, in the U S and it's, it's, it's continued to change and morph as time's gone on, but your average personal trainer, if you see them in the U S you can tell that they're a personal trainer. Yeah. They're just physically fit. You, they usually do have a background in sport. They went to university specifically and studied exercise physiology. Um, whereas I would say the average Canadian personal trainer doesn't always look like that. Um, they're much more cerebral. And that's not to say that one is better than the other. Um, it's just different. But they're studying nutrition, kinesiology. Yeah, the scope of practice is pretty much the same in terms of what you're, you know, legally allowed to do or not do from, you know, country to country. Um, there's not, you know, huge fundamental differences there. But yeah, there, there's definitely some some differences between the two. And then, yeah, you have to treat people differently, right? Mm -hmm. So even when I lived in California and worked there or versus Colorado versus, say, Texas, the, the different nuances are, are different. So, I mean, I could run a team meeting in anywhere in the U.S. and I could use all sorts of football analogies and everyone in the room would resonate. Yeah. If you do, if you know, you should, you, in Canada, if I ran a team meeting, and I use nothing but football analogies, no one's going to understand what I'm talking about. I, I will not know 1%. I, but if I change it all to hockey, yeah, the vast majority of the room then knows. So I'm like, or, okay, or guys. basketball. Well, just, you got, you got to use different yeah. sports and yeah. different, you get, it's just all contextual, right? So yeah. you just got to be, you know, kind of read the room and know your audience and those types of things. But then, yeah, I mean, I don't think that the employees necessarily, I mean, I think, I think universally employees wanted to be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. I think uh, people want to work for a company in something that ideally they believe in. Um, you know, they want to ha have fun when they're at work, you know, some, some basic truths that I think, I mean, I don't think that's just U.S. versus Canada. I think that's globally, you know, what, what people are looking for. And uh, within this experience, uh, it's been three, four years with uh, Fit Throw? Uh, three and a half or so now since we came out, yeah. How have you evolved as a leader? What has changed in your leadership style? It's a great question because I've been now, I mean, I've been a you know, vice president since I was 30 years old. I'm 49 now. So I've been doing executive leadership a long time. So I'm constantly trying to learn and grow and evolve. I'm certainly in a executive leadership kind of president CEO position, you know, the nuances of from my time doing it at Steve Nash through the pandemic to now and kind of what have I learned or what's different. I think what I've figured out more as time's gone on is like, you know, when to give people more autonomy, when to trust them. Uh, I think, you know, generally you, you certainly have a lot more kind of control as you grow up through business. And then at a certain point you have to give up control but you got to give it up at the appropriate time to the appropriate people and, and kind of, I think having the skill set to figure that out and navigate that is kind of maybe what's really different now versus say, you know, five years ago, six years ago for myself. And how do you usually spot someone being ready to become more autonomous? Well, I mean, again, it depends on what level we're talking about, but I mean, from a, from an executive, you know, perspective, it's, you know, they're already doing the work. Right. So they're doing things without being asked to do them or without being reminded. Right. So they're already kind of fulfilling 
those roles and expectations. And, you know, ideally they have the similar passion and drive that you do to kind of, you know, have the same kind of success. So it's just being like-minded and, and you don't have to have the same style. Cause I would say nobody on my team is stylistically like I am. I mean, I already know that I'm a bit of a unicorn that way in terms of who I am, how I carry myself, what I do, all that sort of stuff, right, wrong, indifferent, good, bad, or whatever. But yeah, I'm not, we're not trying to have like robots or clones or copies. We want everyone to be genuine and authentic to, you know, they're who they are as a person, yeah. but we're like-minded on what are the outcomes that we're looking for, right? Like what are the goals that we're all trying to achieve? You mentioned uh, earlier that you have had mentors. What lessons did you learn from say one or two of those mentors that were crucial for you to, to take you to the next level? in terms of becoming a better leader or a better business person? I won't name names on this one, but only because I don't want to embarrass them, but I, they probably wouldn't even remember the story. So I was a newly promoted vice president. I just got promoted to vice president. I just relocated my family. I'm in a new area and I get my first big HR issue and I got a big HR issue on my desk. And so I'm asking the human resources professionals, what's the precedent? How do we normally handle these things? So we go through this process and it's basically a business decision, but this is one that's going to affect me basically firing several people or not firing them, right? Potential disciplinary action, whatever. And I have no experience doing this, so I don't know what to do. So I called my boss, right? The executive vice president, if you will, right? And so I called that individual and got him on the phone. I said, yeah, I got a question. I got a scenario. I got a problem. And so I explained it all in you know, pretty vivid detail of exactly what I was dealing with and why and what, what, what do we need to do and how do we you know, protect the business, protect the, the team members, just do what's right. Right. And after I explained it all, there's just silence to where I looked at my VoIP phone to see if it was disconnected. And then I was like, then I was on speaker. So I picked it up dude, and I said, hello, you know, so are you still there? And they're like, yep. I was like, oh, I, I thought we got disconnected. And I just, did you get all that? Like, yep. I'm like, so what do you think? They're like, I think I'm questioning why I promoted you to vice president. And I said, good answer. Thank you for your time. If I need additional assistance, I'll let you know. And so I think that that was kind of that first moment of like, look, if you're going to be in this seat, then you got to be in that seat. And that that's the consequences of leadership. It's making tough decisions. And, you know, there's lots of different examples of, of that through, you know, you can read military history books about, you know, different commanders and different people from all over around when they're faced with difficult decisions. But that's kind of, that's what leadership is, is encompassed is, is you want to be fair. You want to be equitable. Um, but you want to protect those that you're deemed to protect. And in, like in my current position, I have fiduciary responsibilities to my partners. I also have commitments around my mission statement, my vision statement, my core values to all of my team members, right? And my members alike, because those core values are about how we're supposed to service them and their, you know, craft their experience when they're in our clubs. And so, you know, those are the things you have to do. And so you kind of have to separate how are people going to feel or what is this about or your own even feeling sometimes and just stay really focused on like what is the outcome that we need to get and why and let that kind of guide the decision and when do you fire someone well that's a tough one i mean there's a lot of different things but i would say for me the, the three easy ones are lie cheat or steal so if you lie to me directly you cheat on something where you're let's say we're doing a contest and you're manipulating the contest in a way that's just unethical um, or again, if you're stealing from the business, then you obviously just don't have the moral compass of the kind of people we're looking for. So those are kind of the no brainers from a performance management standpoint. I mean, I tell people all the time, I fire, I haven't fired that many people. I've had tough conversations where we'll agree to say, Hey, we're going to quote unquote, uh, you know, free up your future, or this just might not be a right fit. Like, let's be honest with each other. Like there, this just doesn't seem like something you're that passionate about to where they can then make a decision. I mean, I've had, I've had, lots of people that I've employed for 30, 60, 90 days while they look for their next job. And I knew they were looking, Yeah. but that's always kind of been not necessarily the Richard Branson who talks about it, right. With Virgin and all of his different businesses. Right. But treat people like you want them to never leave, but also treat them and manage and lead them in such a way that if they leave, you know, they'll be successful somewhere else. Right. And so that's kind of always been the mindset is like, yeah, we don't want people to leave and we're not trying to ever really quote unquote fire people. Our job is to make them successful. If we can't make you successful, then the chances are that you might not be where you're supposed to be. Yeah. See you guys. See you. <laughs> I love that. We're absolutely on the same page. Yeah. 
Chris, um, you mentioned your attitude will determine your altitude. Is that yeah. correct? Am I misquoting you? That's one of them. You're, yeah. I got, yeah. I got a lot of Chris's. That's what I wanted to know. So it depends tell how many you want to get in. Tell me, That's tell one me of, your, one of many. Your, your mantras. Let's, let's go, let's list, try to list three of them and, uh, and talk a little bit about well, I gave you the, you know, chase your passion, not your pension. Yeah. We talked about your attitude will determine your altitude. Yeah. My team actually has like a, a whole page of these or like a book. We joke one day we're going to open a club with all the Smithisms like all over the walls and have the members be like, wow, what, like, what's this? That's but a good idea. I think it's a little too narcissistic. So no, like no. one or two quotes. I think it'd be a little, I don't, I don't want to be the narcissist guy. Even like I try to teach people even now, I try to teach young people like, so give you an example, today's generation. And we teach this in like sales environments, right? Which is some will, some won't, so what next, right? So like if I was saying, I'm trying to give you, get, I'm trying to get you to buy into something I'm selling to you. It could be any idea or any concept. So let's just say I was really passionate politically about an initiative or a cause. Everyone I talk to is not going to come to my side, but that, so in other words, I could explain my position to as many people as possible in the hopes that, but I'm just going to keep going. So I'm never going to be deterred. I'm not going to let people like slow me down. Mm -hmm. So some will, some won't, so what, and next. So that's kind of the attitude that I try to teach personal trainers specifically about what's required to be mentally like, well, what you call a life changer, right? Or if you can truly quote them, you know, like make a difference for somebody. Yeah. So, cause if you're, if you're in the mindset, like I'm, I'm going to make a difference in your life and I'm going to be a life changer. And like, if you really believe that, like if that's something that burning inside of you, then when someone tells you no, like they don't want an appointment with you, the, you have an appointment, they don't want to be a client. Uh, they were a client for a, like a test session, like they did three sessions with you and they say, Hey, thanks, but no, thanks. None of that ever deters you because you know that there's somebody else that needs your help and is waiting for you, right? You understand the global, you know, obesity epidemic. You understand, you know, all the people that are inside these facilities that are still needing and wanting help, uh, from injury pre prevention, for aesthetic reasons, for mental health. And so it's just really about that mindset again of like, that's something we teach there, right? Which is just some well. Some won't. So what next? So in other words, when people tell you, no, you're not offended. Yeah. So, you, you know, you hear about that all the time on entrepreneurial stories or business stories or people that publish their first book, right? It's like, well, how many people told them no before they published their first book? Usually it's a lot of people told them no, but they just kept going and kept going and kept going. So it's really that mentality kind of pinned down in an acronym that I would say is explainable and coachable. Because for me, that's what it's about, right? I'm trying to take young people who don't know enough to be as successful as they want to be. So most people I meet want to be really successful, but they don't know how to do it. And so it's giving them tools and equipping them mentally on here's what you need to be successful. And so it's about, yeah, not just mindset, but also some conversational skills and or, you know, consultative sales skills or whatever it might be to help them get where they want to go. That's in your book? No, it's not in my book. <laughs> I get people all the time tell me I need to write a book, but I'm yeah. like, I, I'm too busy to write a book. And frankly, that's not really what I want to do. Maybe, maybe with chat GPT and all this stuff coming out, maybe I'll, you know, one day I'll, I'll get there. But at this stage, I'm not there yet, but I, we teach that though. So we teach a lot of courses. So like one of the things that makes us different in our business, as an example, is if you get hired as a new hire, right, we're going to nurture you along the way. So a lot of places they will you'll hire you and put you out there and like, go get her done. We bring you into our building and we train you for days, right? Yeah. To get you the skills necessary to be successful. And again, it's just a foundation, mm -hmm. but without a foundation, you have nothing, right? So we're trying to put you on a path towards success. You're, everyone's always going to own their own success, right? You know, you, you sometimes you get people like, well, that's my person. What do you mean that's your person? I hired them. And it's like, I, I laugh at people when they do that. I'm like, you didn't make them successful. They made themselves successful. No, but I taught it. They still, they did the work. You didn't do it for them. They did the work. So you can like say, I did my part on like providing them access to tools, resources, education, information, whatever it might be. But when people try to take credit for other people's work, you know, that's, it's a stunt, right? In my opinion, like it's work ethic, right? It's their drive. Yeah. You might've lit the fire, right? But the flame took off and away it goes. And to many times people get in their own way, don't they? They become their main enemies the main obstacle between where they are now and their main goals, it's themselves. Yeah, it's themselves, but it's also the expectations that we live in, right? So it's the it's the world, again, of social media. 
uh, and all the blue light that we talk about, right? It'd be one thing if people get these glasses now where they block out the blue light or try to prevent some of the blue light, not understanding that like you're still on that dopamine hit. And so, so many people are focused on, you know, the next Instagram post, the next TikTok video, the next whatever versus where is life really lived and life is lived through experiences, right? That's where stories come from. That's where, you know, lessons come from. They come from experiences and you're not really getting any experience in anything when you're staring at a screen. And so you're vicariously living through somebody else, quote unquote, whether it's fake, real or otherwise yeah. on these experiences, of what you view, but it's just, you know, that that's the challenge of today's world versus like, you know, where it previously was say lived. You have five kids. Well, they're not kids anymore. How old are they? Uh, well, my oldest is 29 and my youngest is 17 and they're all about three years apart. Okay. So you can kind of just work down the ladder. How is it for them to have Chris Smith as their dad? Depends who you ask. <laughs> I, you know, certainly I think for my youngest, which is my son, I have four daughters and one boy. I think for my son, it's probably the hardest, right? He probably has the most expectations to as he grew up to quote unquote, be his dad. But, uh, probably where I'm most proud of him is that he's not right. He's not like me at all. So he didn't play any sports that I played. Um, academically, he's you know, far brighter than I ever was, you know, as a young man. And so he's kind of finding his own path. And I think all of my children have, have, have kind of found their own path as time got, has gone on. But I'd say, yeah, I mean, I think that they know that there's, there's expectations <laughs> in the sense of, I want them to be good people more than anything. I want to be good people. We had another guest here, William, from IRL Group here in Vancouver. His main value th that he wants to pass to his children is be kind. Yeah. I even bought him a t-shirt. Be kind. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I think that's part of it, but I think there's even for me, I mean, that's, t that's a great quality, but I think it, it can be broader than that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think what they, if anything, I hope what they're seeing from me is that I help people, is that I'm a giver and I'm a, you know, nurturer. And then I'm very, you know, empathetic to plights of people or, you know, people that, you know, have not been as fortunate as I have been or whatever. And, you know, hopefully they're seeing me give back and serve others in a way that, you know, inspires them to want to serve others as they continue to kind of navigate life. But your parents got divorced when yeah. you were 12. Sure. Did you still uh, see your dad often? How was it? Yeah, I saw him a lot. I mean, definitely, you know, helped shape me in some other ways. So, I mean, we talked a lot about the athletic side, but, you know, I moved in with my dad when I was 16. He was in construction. Uh, he would get up at 2.33 in the morning so he could be at every practice. So he'd be at my practice. He would drive almost two hours to work. That's how far he would drive back to my commute we talked about earlier. He would make a two-hour drive to work, work for eight hours on a construction site, drive two hours back just so he could watch my practices. And then, he, and he literally never missed a game. And then I started doing construction as a young man. And, you know, if anything, you know, I learned a lot of things, but I definitely learned my profanity on construction sites at a young age. Uh, you know, I did a lot of construction in the summers and grew up mm -hmm. on job sites and being teased and all that kind of stuff by, you know, kind of that climate, but it was definitely good lessons and work ethic and getting up early and, you know, grinding out a day and putting in an honest day's work. So what was the main lesson you learned from your dad and from your mom? Oh, uh, well, I think for my dad, it was just this, this undying kind of work ethic, which, you know, I've certainly have, a, have applied to my life, um, for sure. And I think for my mom, she's just always has a positive disposition. So it's finding the good in situations, right? Even though there might be lots of bad. And what lesson do you want your kids to learn from you and your team members? Uh, I mean, I want my kids to learn, you know, more than anything is that, you know, nothing, nothing is easy. And so I think what they've seen throughout my life and hopefully can observe is like this, you know, the success that I have and the lifestyle that they're able to enjoy or whatever, it wasn't by accident and it wasn't easy. It was purposeful. Um, there was a lot of effort, you know, that went behind it. And I want my team members to feel like they're part of the journey, right? Um, that we're all kind of doing this together versus, you know, it's just, you know, this ivory tower versus the rest. So myself and all of my, you know, all my leaders, like we're in clubs, right? We go to the clubs, we meet with people, we talk with people, uh, with, you know, regularity because you want to stay close to your team members. Yeah. What are you up to now? What is next for you? What's your next Canadian dream or American dream? 
or a combination of the two. Yeah. I mean, we've looked at a lot of different options around our ability to franchise this business. Um, we could also continue to do corporately owned stores and open to other provinces. Um, you know, probably ones that are closer to us than others would be ideal from a geographic perspective. We've talked about taking our business model down to the U S um, you know, as well and, and kind of experimenting down there. So we've got plans for all those sorts of things. And we've got the kind of the capital, the wherewithal, the drive, the intensity. And then again, back to the team, I got a team that a lot of people want to grow mm-hmm. and they want to experience, you know, additional, you know, growth, both professionally, they want to grow their, you know, income and all those sorts of things. So certainly we're, we're poised to kind of position the business to do that. And do you feel that the population is prepared now to uh, more and more to take exercising more seriously, uh, also as a as a key component for good health. I think so. I mean, I, I st- uh, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that we're there yet, where it's not as mainstream as I think we still needed to be. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Meaning, so we took media as a whole, right? Like we're here today, and you know, podcasts, um, you know, this type of content, if you will has been massively disruptive to to what I call traditional media. So traditional media used to report on stories that made sense. Well, like talking about fitness and what it can do for people would make sense for traditional media to cover. The traditional media now will only cover things that they're paid to cover, mm-hmm. right? It's all, it's a pay to play game now, a hundred percent. So that's very different than even five years ago, it's changed tremendously from what it was to what it is. Uh, and that's just even my own experience, right? Like We used to send out PR stuff with like, here's all the stuff we're doing. Here's what's going on. And we have tons of news people want to cover it because it was good to talk about. Now they're like, well, yeah, but like, how much do you want to pay for that spot? And it's like, what are you talking about? So it's just a very different world. But I do think generally speaking that because of the content that's out there now, there's a lot of exposure that people can absorb. All right. So I was still talking about the Canadian dream. 49, five kids, big business, 700 people in your team. What was the secret to get here? I wish there was a secret, right? Like if there was a magic pill you could give everyone and say, what would you pay for this? And what would you take? And, you know, there's always those kind of examples and, you know, but it's, it's not reality. And so it's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I tell people all the time, I'm very lucky. I'm like, well, what does that mean? I go, hard work meets opportunity. Yeah. And so again, back to the early mornings and the late nights and being willing to move and transition my family and move to different places for different opportunities, making sacrifices that way. Uh, cause that's, you know, moving kids out of schools and into new schools. Like everybody in my family had to make sacrifices in order for me to, you know, have the success that I've wanted to have for my own career, uh, over time. And so, you know, I think a lot of people nowadays don't understand that, right? It's again, this instantaneous, I want it now and versus understanding like, well, you're going to get it what you want if you just chase your passion, right? So back to like, if you chase the passion versus the pension, then things will come to you and come towards you as, as time goes on. Or even I think just back to mindset, people want to be entrepreneurs as an example. And it's like, well, I want to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to do my own thing. And it's like, okay, but do you know what you need to know? And so I don't think there's anything wrong working for other people. (laughs) Certainly. I don't think there's anything wrong working for corporations. I didn't start my career with, oh, I'm going to own my own fitness company someday. That was never an, an intention or a goal. That's how it evolved over time. And not to say it wasn't never a goal, but it certainly wasn't my initial desire, right? At first, and when I first started in the industry, it was like, I want to be the best personal trainer that I can be. I want to help my clients get to their goals in the safest, fastest, most effective way possible. By doing that really well, they said, hey, do you want to be a manager? Then by being a manager really, really well, they said, do you want to be a district manager? By be, doing being a district manager, the best that I could be, right? Do you want to be a vice president by being the best vice president that I could be? And so those things all take time, right? And those all kind of position you. And again, like as we've discussed today, there's lessons along the way. There's things to be learned along the way, provided you're open to learning, right? So as long as you have an open mindset, you're not closed off to learning new things, which most people aren't. I mean, my experience is most people are in the mindset that they want to be a lifelong learner. So it almost comes down as, are you partnered with the right teacher? right? For what it is you're actually trying to learn. Yeah. And many times people who are not doing the homework or the work, they think they know more, right? They know enough. We try to tell young people all the time, some of the tools and systems we're giving them 
you know, the cumulative set of experiences of the tool that we're giving them is a hundred years. Like you'd have to work as a personal trainer for a hundred years, as an example, to get that experience. You'd have to sell memberships in, a, in, in an environment for a hundred years to get to that same kind of, these are the best 10 questions to help people, again, make a decision that's good for them. We're not asking people to, you know, that's the beauty of our industry, right? We're not selling this thing that, you know, and I don't want to make fun of any other industries, but we're not selling tables. We're not selling microphones. Like what we're selling is this thing in a box. Mm -hmm. It's an empty box. And what's inside that box is your dream. It's your goals. We're just selling it back to you and telling you, here's how you can do it. And here's how we can help you get there again, safer, faster, more effective, whatever that might be with all the different amenities and services that the facility has to offer. How do you coach someone uncoachable like your younger self? When you meet other people, sometimes you see yourself in them. Oh, this guy yeah. is just like me 30 years ago. How do you coach them? That's the ego pride side of it, right? So those are the people that are guided by ego and pride. And so if ego and pride is in the way, then that's just a conversation you need to have. And so I'll often say, look, I can coach you, but you need to tell me how you want to be coached. So how do you want to be coached? And they'll say, well, I want to be promoted someday. So I'm not, I'm not sure you do. That's what do you mean? I'm a, that takes a different style of coaching that you'll allow for. Like, what do you mean? Well, in the past, when I've given you feedback, so as an example, we had this conversation at this day and time two weeks ago. We had this other conversation two months ago. And in both of those instances, you were very defensive right away versus you didn't really, like when I get feedback, I want to ask questions for clarification to make sure I understand the feedback in a way that I can move forward in the best way possible versus defending my position of, no, 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 you don't understand. Let me explain to you what I did and why. It's like I, you're, you're in a different place. And so I usually like to just ask anyone that works directly with me, how do you want to be coached? Like what type of relationship are you looking for? And I learned that pretty early on and I use that really all the way up through a lot of my, you know, I would call business career in terms of leading other people. And so what I would say is um, nobody never really did that for me. I had to figure out that lesson on my own a little bit, but uh, it didn't take me long to kind of figure it out. So you have this experience in sports also as a personal trainer and now as a leader in your business. What would you say to someone who actually has big dreams? We're talking about the Canadian dream, whatever it might be, but uh, they, they just let that dream become dormant. They're not acting on it. What would you like to say to inspire or motivate these people? Well, I mean, I think the inspiration or motivation would be, was that really your goal or dream to begin with, you know, or was that just some, you know, hairy fairy, whatever you want to call it, right? Like, like for me, the things that I'm very focused on in my life, like I've never not accomplished them. So I don't really understand that mindset truthfully. And I don't understand, like I can appreciate distraction. I can appreciate setbacks. I can appreciate a lot of things, but the ability to quote unquote, like find your way or navigate it. Like if you're genuinely that interested in getting it done, then you will find a way. Right. And so I would just say to those people that, you know, if they're maybe a little bit slower and you want to be, then, you know, challenge yourself again, how much time am I spending on social media versus how much time am I spending researching my new project? Yeah. How much time am I spending on, you know, things that don't matter as it, as it relates to doing what it is I want to do and accomplishing my dream or getting to my goal versus I'm spending time on all these other things. And so, you know, that's what I've always say hyper-focused on. At the same time, even as they're like, we have a, you know, like again, I have five children. I never missed a play. I never missed a sporting event. I never missed a student teacher meeting. Like I never missed any of those things because I still going to budget and manage my life to be a great parent at the same time or do the best that I can do. Ultimately, my kids would be the only ones that could say, hey, yeah, he was a great dad, right? I mean, all kids say their dad's the best ever, so. I mean, that's why all the Father's Day cards all read the same way. Not all of them. <laughs> well, maybe not all of them. But my point being, you know, yeah, I think that, you know, I would just tell people like, you know, refocus. If, you're, if you've lost focus, challenge yourself to say, is that really my passion? And if the answer to that is truly yes, then really look at the equation of how you're allocating time. Yeah. And then if that doesn't align with that, then I would come back and say, well, then I challenge that that's your passion. And do the work. Yeah, if you're not if you're not spending the time, you're not doing the work, then that's probably not what you you're really wanting to do. What I would add to that is you you have to be passionate about the process. You have to enjoy the journey. I know it sounds so cliche, but 
it is the journey that I would say the journey is 90% yeah. of the goal. And when you achieve your goal, okay, that's the last 10% that you're going to enjoy. But all the 90%, oh, knowing that everything, every step sure. is leading you toward that direction. Yeah, we talk about it, and I talk to my team about it this way, where we talk about systems and processes, right? Yeah. And then there's behaviors is like the second bucket, and then there's the result. So a lot of people want to talk about the result, but we have a system and a process for everything, right? And then from that system and process, then it becomes, well, what are you doing with it? Are you using it? to the best of your abilities. Because if you are, then the result generally will take care of itself. Yeah. And that can be applied across, you know, a lot of different things. I mean, I use a pyramid of success that I teach to people, which, you know, the bottom of the pyramid is the ABCs, which is attitude, belief, and commitment. The next part of that is planning an organization, right? And it just keeps going all the way up. And then the top of it is discipline, right? Because to get through the process, the hardest thing to do once you're on top of something is to stay there. Right. So like you talked about the running and the training and all that involved. And I was lifting and running for six to eight hours a day. Right. So it's like, gosh, Chris, why, why, why are you in the same shape you were in 25? Well, number one, I'm 49 now and I'm not 25. And I also don't train eight hours a day now. Right. I'm lucky if I'm, you know, hopefully I get my one hour a day of workout in, which I try really hard to do, but you know, it's a different world. Right. Another thing I say to my team is the harder it is now, the easier it will be later. So I embrace the, you know, the suffering, mm. the, the, the struggle. Yeah, let's do it. Let's get up. We could wake up at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Let's say we're traveling. We have a shoot in Prince George. We could wake up at 8 a.m. and go film. But hey, man, if I wake up at 6 a.m., I can go and get the aerial shots that I really dreamed of and, and give it away and give it to the client. Sure. You know, and just while the client they're not even paying for that but oh but this will make things better yeah one year later six six months later etc yeah so whatever we do sacrificing now in in that will probably make your life easier it's it's it, all the same it's your it's, kids it's now. the same types of things your kids enjoying embrace. your sacrifices you just embrace the struggle right yeah the struggle is real that phrase that people hear about I mean, you know, or, or use like in common vernacular language or whatever. I mean, yeah, the struggle is real all the time, but it's what you do with it. And it's how you handle it. And it's what is your attitude and what is your approach and are you solutions orientated and are you moving it forward versus just going, oh, I, I just give up. I can't and whatever. Right. So it's just back to what, where's your mindset? What's your mentality? Right. Chris, it's been such a pleasure meeting you. It. Yeah, finally. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, how can people find you? Do you want people to find you? <laughs> uh, they can if they want. I mean, I would say LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to find me. So I'm there. So you can find me really easy. Again, Chris Smith, Fitness World Canada. Yeah. Uh, I am on Instagram, but I'm not very active there. So if you're looking for a really boring follow, come there. But uh, uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place to find me. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, for you watching or listening to this episode, thank you so much for sticking with us until the end. If you are on YouTube, please remember to like, share, and to subscribe also to our channel. It is people like you that refer this video to other people and to subscribe to our channel that really help us grow this community. Thank you so much. I'll see you on the next episode.